I'm Pastor Tony. If you're joining us online and, and you haven't seen me before, I'm Pastor Tony. Welcome to LifeSpring uh, Community Church today. And whether you're participating with us here in the auditorium or online, my prayer is that you will meet with Jesus today and that you will have a significant connection with him before you leave here today. Now, one of the most confusing conversations I was ever a party to involved some new slang that I hadn't heard before. I was working as an engineering manager at 3M Company, and somebody used the word fat, P-H-A-T. Now, not being familiar with P-H-A-T, I immediately thought of F-A-T. And I was working at 3M, and a young lady had just started working for us, and I was sitting in the lunchroom with one of the younger uh, engineers, and he motioned over to the new girl and said, man, that is one fat lady. And I looked at him shocked and said, dude, that is so rude. He was like, man, what are you talking about? Look at her. I mean, she is totally fat. And I looked at her, and I mean, she couldn't have weighed more than 100 pounds. And, And I'm like, dude, no way. First of all... You never say that about a woman, even if it's true. And second of all, you never say that about a woman, period, unless you've got some kind of death wish. It's like, it's like meeting someone for the first time and asking her when she's expecting. That's just not wise, right? And, and I'm like, what are you doing? Well, at that moment, I was looking at, at him, and I didn't realize she had walked over, and she said hi, and he looked up at her and said, hey, Luce, you're looking fat today. And she said, ah, how sweet, and walked away. I was shocked. I was dumbfounded. I didn't know what to say to that. I had nothing left to say. It was insanity. Well, the Urban Dictionary defines the word fat, P-H-A-T, as an acronym meaning pretty, hot, and thick. And by thick, it means it's it's describing someone who's attractive both physically and in character. They're in the thick of it, right? Uh, They are all that in a bag of chips, kind of like your pastor, you know? Uh, In reference to music, it refers to kind of a contemporary uh, music with an original sound that kind of jives with the culture. It's like I could say, dude, my MJ, our music was so fat this morning. And, And that would make sense to some people. So basically, guys, the next time your wife asks you if she looks fat in that dress, you can say, yeah, baby, never fatter, but you didn't hear it from me. Fat may get you in good with your wife, maybe not. Uh, It may get you in the groove of our culture. It may get you into your favorite nightclub or hangout. It may get you into the cool group at school. But the question this morning is, will fat get you into heaven? Today we're continuing our series called uh, A Better Character. And we're looking at developing within us a character that reflects the character of Jesus Christ. And today's message is fat people on a skinny path. Jesus is concluding his Sermon on the Mount with a challenge to make a definitive choice in our lives. So go ahead and open your Bibles or Bible apps to Matthew chapter 7. We're looking at verses 13 and 14 this morning. Uh, There is this uh, note-taking outline and action plan that is available in the back of the auditorium. For those of you online, you won't be seeing any of this on your screen today like you normally do, but you can open up the app, you can open up the website, and you can look at it uh, there as well. That action plan is also available so that you can kind of do your devotional this week and and apply this lesson uh, to your life. So let's go ahead and stand this morning, and we're going to read God's Word together. We're going to read Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Uh, I've got it in the New Living Translation, and that's what we'll be reading. So read it with me. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Let's go ahead and pray and ask God to teach us today. Father, take your word as Jesus spoke it there on the hillside to the crowds that day, been preserved for us by your apostle Matthew, as well as others. And and it is here for us today to change our life, 
to transform us into the people you originally created us to be. And we ask by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would do that in us today for the kingdom of God's glory. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So Jesus is now at the point where he, he is asking his hearers to make a definitive choice. Jesus says there's only ever two alternatives before us. You must choose either between following God or following the world, what the world calls the good life, the way of the world. Uh, One choice leads to life, the choice to follow Jesus, and the other choice leads to death and destruction. God told the prophet Jeremiah In Jeremiah 21.8, he says, And to this people you shall say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. There is this choice before us every moment of every day. This is the most important choice you will make in your life. And as we're going to see this morning, in one sense, it's a one and done kind of choice. You make the choice to follow Jesus Christ. You surrender the leadership of your life to him, and he becomes your Lord and Savior. And that is a one-and-done choice. No one can undo that. But in another sense, it's also a choice that you and I, as followers of Christ, have to make every moment of every day. Right? It's one thing to surrender our life to Christ and be accounted his children and brought into his kingdom, but it's another thing to live that out in our daily lives. And we're talking about developing this better character. The passage here has been a favorite of artists you know, for centuries. Most paint the scene as a person at a crossroads, kind of like this picture. Uh, see if we can get it up there. Yeah. So well, you know, while you can look at this picture, you can see the choice between the wide road and the narrow way. You can see it very, very clearly in this picture. The actual narrow gate is covered over by weeds and ivy and trash that's blown around from the highway. And our job as followers of Jesus Christ is to point out the narrow gate to our friends and neighbors, because it's not always that easy to see, especially in this culture we're living in. So what does Jesus want for us this morning? First, he wants us to know you can enter the kingdom of God. That's the good news of the gospel. That, that's, that's what Jesus says in, in verse 13 of the passage we read uh, just now. It says, you can Enter into the kingdom. You can enter God's kingdom. The way may be hidden by the world or by personal human sin, but it's never locked. It's never locked. You don't need a secret handshake or a secret password or a stamp on your driver's license or passport. Jesus broke the lock when he died on the cross. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. Notice that John doesn't say that only fat people can have eternal life. He says, whoever believes in him. So the only prerequisite is that you put your trust in Jesus. He also doesn't say to believe something about Jesus. Jesus. He doesn't say believe Jesus. You can believe Jesus tells the truth. You can believe all kinds of things about Jesus and still not believe in Jesus. Turn to the person next to you right now and tell them as sincerely as you can, I believe you. Tell them, I believe you. It feels pretty good, doesn't it, in this world that somebody actually believes you. But now turn to the person next to you and tell them, I believe in you. I believe in you. How's that feel? Does that feel better? How many people think that feels better? Yeah, right? I mean, it, they're, it's different to say I believe you and to say I believe in you. 
right? I believe you means that, hey, I generally think you tell the truth. You know, I, 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 I thought about this and I think that you have no good reason to lie about what we're talking about. Now, if I did think you had a good reason to lie about it, I'm not sure if you would tell the truth. But right now, I believe you're telling the truth, right? I mean, that's what that means. But when you say, I believe in you, that means I trust you. That means I know you have my back. That means I don't know exactly what you're going to do about this situation, but I know this, you won't let me down. That's what it means to say I believe in you. Believing in Jesus means trusting that Jesus can and will deliver eternal life. It's putting your trust in the death and resurrection as sufficient to open the gate to heaven. To open the gate to the kingdom of God to you. Not you in a general sense, but you individually. It means that no matter what, Jesus will make this happen. Now the question for each of us this morning here in this room, and those of you watching on the live stream, is does that describe you? Do you believe in Jesus? Are you trusting totally and completely in the work of Christ on the cross for you? Because if you're not, Jesus has a word for you this morning. You can. You can can enter the kingdom of God. And the cool thing about believing in Jesus versus believing Jesus or believing things about Jesus is that you can believe in Jesus and still have questions. You can believe in Jesus and still have some doubts here and there. You can believe in Jesus and not know everything you need to know about Christianity, about God, about the world we live in. You can believe in Jesus and not have it all together. Because believing in Jesus means that you're trusting that Jesus is going to take care of even those things that you question, even those doubts that you have, and even those things you don't have all together this morning. See, that's the good news. You can enter God's kingdom. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, because it's not about you. It's about what Jesus did for you. That's the good news. Now, the bad news is that you must enter by the narrow gate. You must enter by the narrow gate, right? You can enter the kingdom of God, but verse 13 continues and says, only through the narrow gate. We live in a culture that loves options. We love our options. We're immediately suspicious of anyone who claims to have the only solution, right? We were immediately suspicious of those people. We say there's more than one way to skin a cat, and then the SPCA shows up at your house, right? I mean, there's, if you want to keep your cat alive, then your options are severely limited at that point. When you get to LAX, there are lots of options as to planes you can board. There's lots of terminals with lots of gates and lots of planes coming and going at each gate. There are 1,660 flights taking off from LAX in a typical day. 1,660 flights in a typical day. That's one every 70 seconds. That is a lot of options with a lot of destinations. But if you want to end up at a particular destination, then your options get narrowed down considerably, right? In some cases, you only get one. If you want a direct flight to Dubai, you had better be at Bradley Terminal by 2.30 p.m., Because they estimate 90 minutes to get through security, and you need to be sitting in your seat 
at 4.15 p.m. Because that's when they close the doors. And if you get to the airline gate at 4.16 p.m., you can wave goodbye to the plane when it leaves, but you can't get on. They don't wait for anyone unless they have the word prince in front of their name. Okay? If you want to go to Dubai, that's the only way you can do it. Period. No exceptions. If you miss the flight, you better hope you bought refundable tickets. Because it's their airlines, it's their rules. And you don't argue. Well, it's God's kingdom. It's God's rules. And his rules are amazingly generous, amazingly gracious. And human beings still complain. He will accept you with all of your sin. He will accept you with all of your sin, and he will forgive every single one. And after he accepts you, if you sin again, he'll forgive that one too. And if you sin the same sin over and over and over and over and over and over again, like one or two of us does, uh, he will actually forgive those sins too if you confess it and repent of it. He will do that again and again and again and again and again until the day that you die. And he will give you eternal life. He will give you peace with God, power for living, and a relationship with your creator. And you can have all of that. But you have to come through Jesus. That's the narrow gate. You have to come through Jesus, period. No exceptions. It's his kingdom. It's his rules. Second question for each of us individually this morning. Have you entered through the narrow gate? Have you entered through the narrow gate? Have you gone through Jesus? Let's see. Does your relationship with Jesus change your purpose, your priorities, and your agenda? Is your life fundamentally different because Jesus is a part of it? Your faith must be central to your life. It can't be an add-on. It can't be, I go to church, you know, once or twice a month, and, uh, and you know, you can check my attendance because they keep track of those things. I, I check in every week when I'm there. So you can check with the church. I, I've done that. That's not it. That's not it. Yeah, but I go to Life Spring. Oh, sorry, that's not it either. I mean, yeah, I, I like our church. I think it's amazing. But that's not it. It's about Jesus having center stage in your life. You can't just live like everyone else and tack on a few religious activities to your life. That first question is internal. Has there been an internal transformation? The second is external. Has your decision changed the way you live your life? And can you trace that change back to some specific biblical teaching of which the Holy Spirit has given you the power to obey? Because without the Holy Spirit's power, you're not going to obey this book anyway. But you read it in here and you thought, oh my goodness, that needs to be a part of my life. And so you prayed and you asked the Holy Spirit to empower you to live a, a, an abundant and overcoming life in this specific area, and he gave you the power to do that. Has that happened in your life? Can you look back over the last five or ten years and see that you are living and loving like Jesus? If you can, then you probably did gave your life to Christ, and he's working in you, and he's alive in you. In John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10, Jesus, Jesus tells this amazing story. I love this. He's talking, um, he's talking to his disciples. He says, I tell you the truth, and he's talking to actually the whole crowds around him. He says, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. I am. 
All else are thieves and robbers, but the true sheep do not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved, not might be saved, will be saved. They will come and go freely, and they will find good pastures. I'm going to take care of them. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. What an amazing promise that Jesus gives to those who will listen and follow. You can enter God's kingdom. You can, as long as you enter by the gate that he has provided. That gate is Jesus Christ, but the human dilemma is that you have a lot of other options in this world today. There are a lot of other options. You do. The world, the devil, our own selfish desires all create for us other options, other things that promise satisfaction, promise to this rich and abundant life. Those options don't go where you want to end up. I promise you. Jesus said, The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for all the many who choose to go that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult. There's an and there. The gateway is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. The wide gate is not some single-lane dirt road, you know. It's more like the 405 heading south into L.A., right? It's like this huge, you know, concrete, uh, you know, pavement that's going down into LA. There are lots of lanes that you can drive on, but if you're not paying attention, you can end up in one of those exit-only lanes and wind up in Cucamonga someplace, right? I mean, if you're not careful, you, this, there's so many options, you can wind up somewhere completely different from where you want to be. And there's lots of off-ramps along the way that leads to a lot, lead to a lot of different and interesting things to do and, and see. There's lots of Starbucks along the side of the freeway. It's easy to get distracted and lose sight of your goal and lose yourself in the process. The wide gate Jesus is talking about is the way of this world. It's the cultural construct where everything's fine. Everything's okay. You can do whatever you want because you're free. It's that place where we're encouraged not to rock the boat. Let it, let it go. Let it go. And as long as you do that, you're accepted and you fit in. You're fat. The wide gate's a lot easier. It's a lot easier. The only downside is it leads to destruction. The Greek word apolion, apolion, it can be translated destruction, waste, or ruin. Plato uses this word and says that evil is all that corrupts and apollyon and destroys. Evil is all that corrupts and destroys. Same word is used in in Revelation for the prince of demons who ushers in the final destruction to planet Earth. Same name. That demon is named apollyon. In that sense, the destruction Jesus is talking about can be experienced both now and in our eternal future. And Jesus promises us that if we will follow him, we can live an abundant life. That's the way of the narrow gate. The alternative is to go with the flow through the wide gate and end up with a wasted life, one that has no eternal value. Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a path that looks right, or there's a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. It ends in death. Jesus says that, that, that the gate is narrow. Human beings shy away from it. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. It's the cross. That's the narrow gate. It's the cross. The cross is the only way into the kingdom. The cross is the narrow way. If you don't believe me, bring up the cross in some social setting or on social media and see what happens. It's the narrow way, believe me. 
The good news of the cross is it's not about what you do. It's about what Jesus has already done for you. And because you didn't do anything to get in, you can't do anything to get kicked out. You can't lose your salvation because Jesus purchased it for you. You didn't purchase it yourself. You didn't put it on your credit card and have your credit card declined. Jesus paid for it. You can't lose it. He bought it for you. However, even after you get through the narrow gate, there's an and in this passage. Even after you get through the narrow gate, there is still a narrow road. Once you're in the kingdom of God, there's still a narrow way before you. The Greek word translated difficult road comes from a root that means to crowd. It means to crowd. It translates as difficult, hard, afflicted, or narrow. It describes the situation currently on the 23 freeway where you're in a nine-foot lane right up next to the concrete K-rail. Anybody like that? You know? You love that, don't you? I mean, it's, it's nerve-wracking, man. I, get done. I don't even notice it. I'm normally pretty cool when I drive. But, I mean, I get done, and I'm like, oh, man, my fingers. i got to get them off the steering wheel, right? I mean, it's just, and then you get the big trucks that drive right up next to you in the second lane, and you're between the big truck and the concrete K-rail and the truck's doing this bit, you know, ba 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 and you're like, I gotta get out of here! I gotta get out of here! That's what he's talking about. That's what this word means in the Greek. Okay? You feel crowded, anxious, and claustrophobic. It's difficult, hard, stressful, and challenging. That's what this word means. Once you get in the kingdom of God, through the narrow gate, there is still a narrow road. Now check this out. You can't lose your salvation, but you can sure waste it. You can sure waste it. Once you get past the narrow gate, you're in the kingdom, and Jesus promises that no one can snatch you out of his hand. You can't walk out, run out, fall out, slip out, or get kicked out, but you can sure wander 40 years in the wilderness. You can sure bury this unbelievable gift in the ground and waste it away, you can sure live as a slave in the land of the free. See, it's like you're panhandling outside of the gates of Amazon up there in Washington, and and Jeff Bezos sees you every day out there, and he thinks, man, that guy is, he's got, he's he's tenacious, he he perseveres, he's got drive, I could use a guy like that. And so Jeff Bezos comes out and he starts talking to you with you and he is so impressed with everything about you except the fact that you're panhandling that he actually chooses to adopt you as his son and make you an heir of his kingdom and his fortune. And he brings you in and sits down with his lawyer. They draw up all the paperwork. You sign it. It's a done deal. And the next day, you walk there to the Amazon gate And you start panhandling again at the gate to Amazon when you're an heir to the fortune that's behind you. That's what many Christians do with their lives. They become heirs of the kingdom of God and they live like a slave in this world. You are a child of the living God. God. You are an heir to the kingdom. Live like that. Live like that. But we get on the narrow road and we get past the narrow gate and we think, great, I've made it. Now I can do whatever I want. And guess what? You can. But why would you? Why would you give up all that is yours in the kingdom of God to live in this world which is all passing away? Why would you destroy the work of God in you in this life for the sake of momentary pleasures that never ultimately satisfy, never take you where you ultimately want to go? You are a child of God. You are no longer a slave. Don't live like a slave. In God's kingdom, you have the word prince or princess in front of your name. You have the right to go anywhere, do anything in God's great kingdom. Make sure you're doing what matters. Make sure you're going where you truly want to be. 
You're not just free to enjoy this life. You're free to make a difference. You're free to populate the kingdom of God. You're free to enjoy the fruit of God's spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You are free to share this amazing gift of salvation with a world that is clawing at the ground for scraps of rotten fruit when the great banquet of God is available to them. You are free to be a gatekeeper in this kingdom, not to bind the gates shut, but to swing wide those heavenly gates and invite everyone to come in. Child of the living God, live in your freedom. Live in the truth of your salvation. You are hot. You are pretty. You are thick. I got it out of order, but you're still fat. And and, and you are the apple of your father's eyes. You are the hope of the world. Use this life to make the biggest difference that you can. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you.